Welcome. I'm Helen Graves, instructional designer with CVC and At One. And for those that aren't familiar with those acronyms, it stands for California Virtual Campus. And At One is the Online Network of Educators, which is the professional development arm of the CVC. Today, I would like to explore with you universal design for learning as a way of supporting learning differences and creating a more equitable learning environment in your courses, kind of like equity by design. By now, we're all pretty familiar with Zoom, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that. We've got everyone muted, so you don't have to worry about background noise or anything going on in your environs. We're in meeting mode in Zoom, so we don't have the Q&A feature that the webinar uh, tool does. If you have a question for me and want to put it in chat, we're going to have time where you can unmute and ask questions, but if you want to put something in chat, I'm going to ask if you would please put a couple of question marks in front of it so that as we're scrolling through, I or one of my minions that I have here helping me will be able to find the questions when we get to the question time. The live transcription has been enabled. To turn it on, you would click the CC live transcript button in the Zoom menu. Depending on your screen size, if the button isn't showing, you would click the uh, more options, the three little dots in order to find it in the list. This session is part of At One's equitable online teaching series. And all of the sessions are free. And we have some wonderful topics coming up. Um, we'll put the link to the information page in chat. Alternatively, you could take a screenshot of this slide so that you can get to the link later on. And thank you very much, Stacy and Cheryl, both for putting it in there. So you should have that. Great. So let's dive into our topic. Anybody know what happens in your brain when you learn something new? What happens is the wiring in your brain literally changes that new idea or behavior or calculation or vocabulary term has never happened in your brain before. So there's, a new, there's not any neural pathway for it to follow. A new pathway has to be created. Most of us assume that every brain is the same, but neuroscience is now telling us that is not the case at all. Turns out every brain is wired differently. Because we're all constantly learning in one form or another, our brains are constantly, <clears throat> excuse me, rewiring, reorganizing and restructuring. And all of these changes are unique to every individual, even when they're learn experiencing the same learning environment. So why is that important? Because if every brain is wired differently, it follows then that every brain learns and comprehends differently. Research shows the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. Every learner brings their own background, needs, skills, interests, whoops, to their unique set of neural pathways, as well as their unique set of neural pathways to that task of learning. And an analogy that was shared with me actually by Michelle Pekansky Brock, who's here, here with us today, that may help you get the point of universal design for learning very quickly. <clears throat> Imagine if every single person on the planet was given a pair of size eight shoes and is expected to live active, productive lives wearing those shoes. That's what we're doing educationally when we take a one size fits all approach to teaching. Instead, doesn't it make sense to vary your content delivery methods and to give learners options in order to accommodate those differences, at least to some degree? That's what the principles of universal design for learning are about. The term universal design comes from the architectural context. Buildings are designed to be flexible and to meet varying needs of all kinds of users. Initially, those adaptations were done to address accessibility, but we've since realized that these design accommodations actually help everybody. Curb cuts are used by people in wheelchairs, obviously, but they also make life easier for people with strollers or people on bikes or people using a cane. 
captions are mainly intended for hearing impaired folks, but I, I know I use captions when the speaker has an accent or they're mumbling or if I'm in a noisy environment. So UDL considers the what, the why, and the how of learning. And similar to architectural universal design, UDL looks at how to minimize barriers and maximize learning for everybody. Some may say that the strategies and methods that are discussed in relation to UDL aren't earth-shakingly new. I don't disagree. I see it more as that UDL provides an umbrella for these ideas and strategies, a new paradigm for thinking about and structuring learning and approaching equity. The core idea of UDL is to add responsiveness to your teaching by offering students multiple options within three broad categories, engagement, representation, and action or expression. We're gonna take a closer look at each of those. And I'm gonna ask you to put on your innovative thinking caps as you listen, because after I give an explanation and a few examples for each category, you're gonna have a chance to brainstorm an idea or two on your specific content. I want this to be not just theory, but where you get a chance to apply in your particular situation. So get ready, let's go. The first category is engagement. <clears throat> Learners differ widely in the ways that in which they can be engaged or motivated to learn. I'm sure you've come to realize that with your own students. Some people are excited by novelty and spur of the moment experiences, while others prefer a more clearly defined structure and sequence. They wanna know exactly what to expect before it happens. Some learners prefer collaborative activities while others are more productive working alone. You can foster motivation and engagement by structuring learning in a way that provides choice and autonomy. As an example, it's probably not appropriate to offer choice in the learning goals themselves, but it is often appropriate to offer choices in how that learning objective can be reached. And you might do that by varying the level of perceived challenge or the context or content that's being used for practice and assessing skills or the tools that are used for information gathering and production, or the sequence or timing for completion of subcomponents or tasks. So as an example, to vary the level of challenge, you might have a standard level assignment and then also offer a problem solver level, not necessarily worth more points, but it's available for those learners who are motivated by a, a bigger challenge. To vary the context, you might offer two relevant prompts for a discussion and ask students to respond to one of them. To vary the sequence, you can look for ways to chunk bigger goals or projects into smaller subtasks and then give students choice in the order in which they're completed. I'm totally making those up, but I think you get the idea. Um, there is going to be a recording. I see the question in chat. We'll have a recording. It won't have a transcript per se, but it will be available and it will be captioned. One of the most powerful ways to spark motivation and interest in an educational setting is to make it really apparent to students the relevance and usefulness of the learning. Don't just ask them to learn something, give them the why. So you wanna choose and, and make it relevant to their experience. So you wanna choose activities and sources of information that are personalized and contextualized to students' lives and experiences. And that as much as possible are culturally and socially relevant and responsive. So for example, incorporate current events into your announcements and even into your activities. If the task is, let's say, critical analysis, you might say, ask the students to pick your favorite TV commercial or your favorite song or your favorite whatever and describe its societal impact. Or if you're providing a list of examples or, um, of something, take the time to include current or diverse options, not the same old, same old in a list of authors Include men and women, white and people of color, famous and obscure, straight, gay, trans, differently abled. Just, you know, make sure 
everybody is visible in the examples and options and lists and things that you're offering. In chat, we're going to share two compilations of openly licensed diverse images that may help you begin to bring more uh, visibility to typically invisible populations. And thank you, Cheryl, for doing that. There's um, one is uh, curated by at one. And then there's a second list that and Michelle found these. So I always have to thank Michelle for a lot of my stuff. The second was posted on walls.io. One of the key factors for students in losing motivation is an inability to recognize their own progress. Especially important is providing formative feedback that allows students to <clears throat> monitor their progress, progress effectively and to use that information, that feedback to guide future efforts and practice. So you can ask questions to guide their self-monitoring and reflection. You can prompt students to identify the type of feedback or advice that they're seeking. I was just working with an instructor who um, teaches poetry and he has students post their poems and then he explains to them the different levels of feedback that authors may be requesting. And so he asked them to tell their classmates, this is the kind of feedback I'm looking for so that it's, it's clear to everybody. You can provide feedback that's informative rather than comparative or competitive. And you can use assessment checklists, scoring rubrics, multiple examples of annotated student work or performance samples so other students are better able to understand and match expectations. A 21st century skill set includes the ability to communicate and collaborate effectively. UDL principles can foster that skill set and support the idea of autonomy and choice by creating cooperative learning groups that have really clear goals, roles, expectations, and responsibilities. Don't just say, go work in your group. Help them know how to structure that. You can provide guidelines in when and how to ask peers or you, the instructor, for help. You can encourage opportunities for peer interaction and support, so peer tutors or peer review or peer study groups. And you can help them by setting up communities of learners that are engaged in common interests or activities, again, like study groups or, you know, whatever it would be. Okay, we always remember better when we actually apply new learning. So now it's going to be your turn to noodle with the ideas. I'm going to have you think about a specific topic or even a specific piece of content or activity in your course. How can you provide greater choice and autonomy with that? How might you make the relevance more clear to your students? How could you increase the collaborative nature of it? And so you don't necessarily need to think about all three things right in this moment, but when you have an idea for one of these, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom and I'll ask you to unmute and share, or you can go ahead and put your idea in chat so everybody can see it. And just take a moment to ponder and think about it. And when you're ready, raise your hand or put it in chat. Great. Okay, Wendy, um, go ahead and unmute and share your idea. Um, I was thinking about the first question with providing greater choice and autonomy. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, provide more text sets so students can choose a reading that relates and then um, respond, you know, to what they choose. Um, I've wanted to do that for a while and I haven't made it that far, but that's my goal. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. And that's a great idea of giving more choice and autonomy. Perfect. Um, Alana says in chat, using more case studies in real world for discussions. And I'm guessing that's um, making it more relevant. I'm thinking, although maybe you have another idea about that, Alana. Okay, so now they're coming in chat. I won't be able to read them all. Uh, Jacqueline, go ahead and unmute. Sure. Um, 
I think one way may be to provide a option as far as I teach computer information systems. Uh -huh. So having two in a discussion board, having two scenarios, scenario A and scenario B, in which they, for example, may be centered around security issues, except maybe one may be a little bit different from one and the other, mm -hmm. and then provide the expectation and making sure that they're equivalent so that the student then can pick which discussion board that they want to do. Right, because which one excites it, them. Yeah. Because it, it can be lean more towards something that they can relate with or connect with, and they can be more excited about yeah. that. Yeah. A second way that I also have done is when I'm teaching uh, various technology topics, I can list maybe five or seven topics that the student can pick from yep. to create their PowerPoint presentation. And I also include, if you have a different topic that you are interested in, uh -huh. talk to me, let me yep. know, just to make sure that it's in the appropriate realm. And it right. just gives them that ability to make that choice. Yeah. And then another option that I do for, for variety and autonomy is when I give them a project, I allow them to pick. You can use a PowerPoint, you can use a Google slide, you can use a Word document, you can use a Prezi. So that therefore now they get to pick the actual tool yep. that they and feel comfortable with yeah when we talk and, about the mm -hmm. topic of um the third thing which is escaping me but it's the demonstration part yep exactly mm -hmm. right perfect thank you thank you for all your ideas and andrew you've got your hand up you are still muted are you able to unmute I'm unmuted. There you go. Um, I have, I teach um, a project that deals with this concept, an abstract concept of the other, which is um, how and why groups get discriminated against, how they get marginalized in society. And um, we do some common readings and then at the end we divide into, student, we divide into group topics based on a group that is othered in society. And they can, um, I usually provide a whole list of, you know, like African-Americans, Latinos, women, et cetera, et cetera. And they can add to that list and they get to choose their own group. Yeah. So they uh, make a choice. It's relevant to their lives because usually they choose right. something that relates to them and it's collaborative. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that example. So I saw a lot of stuff going by in chat as well. And so hopefully it's helping percolate for you so that as you go back and ponder all of these things and how you might wanna make it more applicable in your own courses, you're getting some ideas. So thanks very much for your input, everybody. You're gonna have a chance again as we talk about the next things as well. So moving on, the next category is representation. And remember how brains are wired differently in the ways that learners perceive and comprehend information. So there may be obvious differences of perception, like with a visually impaired or hard of heart hearing student, but other dissimilarities like dyslexia or language or cultural differences can also impact students' perception and comprehension. And those are often things we don't think about Courses designed by those who speak English as a native and sole language can put non-native speakers at risk of not understanding the little nuances of English language, unless we're consciously trying to avoid that pitfall. Differences in cultural or even personal norms can impact how learners participate, including how they respond to questions and their perceived role in the learner-teacher relationship. If we're American-born, chances are pretty good we're going to assume that a student with a question will ask it 
because that's the expectation of our educational culture. But there are cultures where asking questions is perceived as an affront to the teacher's skill. And so we just wanna be mindful of differences like that so we can um, figure out how to address it to make sure every student is getting as much as possible what's going to make the learning experience most impactful for them. There are a couple of helpful articles on cultural impacts that I found, and hopefully Cheryl or Stacy will be able to put those in chat for you. The modality can also be important as well. So some of us grasp information quicker or more efficiently through visual or auditory means rather than printed text. I'm actually the opposite. I would almost always rather read than listen. So you just wanna be thinking about how can I provide options for representation? That's really gonna be essential. And here's one example, and Jacqueline, I think it was Jacqueline, or maybe it was um, whoever was before Jacqueline, already shared this kind of idea. This is an example that Suzanne Joachim of Butte College said I could um, share with you. The way she sets it up for this learning topic Students are given the goal of being able to answer questions that are on a study guide that she's prepared ahead of time. And then she offers them three different text options, all of which address the questions. So they don't have to read all three, they can choose which one. And then she also gives them a number of other options, other links, other videos. And so students get to choose which learning materials to use in order to the, accomplish the task. And she even says, I'd recommend looking at as many of these as is necessary for you to be able to answer the questions on the worksheet or the study guide. So that's just one way of approaching the idea of um, choice in representation. Sound is a particularly effective way to convey the impact of certain kinds of information, which is why sound design is so important in movies. It's something we don't often think about, but if there were no background music or no da da da, da or you know, that kind of thing, it's why the human voice is particularly effective for conveying emotion and significance. We all know that reading an email is often misinterpreted because that vocal element isn't there giving us additional cues to what the person really means. However, those with hearing disabilities, those who need more time to process information, or those with memory difficulties can be challenged if information is conveyed solely through sound. So some ways to offer alternatives for auditory information might be using text equivalents in the form of captions or automated speech to text, voice recognition for spoken language. You could provide visual diagrams, charts, notations of music or whatever it is that you're um, offering them, the concepts. You could provide accurate captions for videos and transcripts for auditory clips. And you could even use visual analogs to represent emphasis or rhythm or whatever. So think emoticons, symbols, or little icons. And here there's an ultra, oh, excuse me, here there's a cultural opportunity as well. So just like with images, if you're using audio examples, expand your awareness, find diverse ones as much as possible. You could even ask your students for ideas of what kind of, uh, content they would recommend that they're aware of that would help you bring in other alternatives to um, audio. On the flip side, visual information can be really dense and isn't equally accessible to learners that have visual disabilities or even to people that are perhaps not familiar with the type of graphic that's being used. So this type of content can be supported by simultaneously providing non-visual alternatives like descriptions, either text or spoken, for images, graphics, video, animations, and using recorded text along with the printed content. Speaking of text, learning materials are often dominated 
by information that is presented as text. But text can actually be a, a weak format for presenting any number of concepts and for clarifying certain processes. So you wanna think about using multimodal formats like illustrations, simulations, images, graphics to deliver content. And that can make information in text more comprehensible for all your learners and accessible for those who might find it completely inaccessible if it's only presented in text. You could present key concepts in one form of symbolic representation, for example, expository text, and then pair that with an alternate form, a physical demonstration, a video, a comic strip, an animation, for example, a math equation paired with a storyboard or a diagram or a model. It's also important to ensure that symbols and vocabulary are made very clear. I review a lot of courses and I can tell you a lot of them make use of abbreviations and terminology that isn't clearly defined. It's the curse of the expert. We know what it means and we forget that our students may not know what it means. So you can use <clears throat> hyperlinks or footnotes with definitions, explanations, illustrations, previous references, whatever's appropriate to help provide clarifications for students. Okay, it's your turn again. So thinking about a specific topic or piece of content or activity in one of your courses and this idea of demonstration, how could you make symbols or vocabulary more clear if those are used in your content? How could you present content or even just a key concept in a paired representation format? So text with illustration or audio with infographic. And again, how could you increase collaboration? So we'll do the same thing. Think about it for a moment. If you have an idea, you could raise your hand or go ahead and put it in chat. And I'll let you ponder while I take a sip of water. Troy provides a table that explains the abbreviations and an example, great. Okay, now they're coming fast and furious. I'm not gonna be able to read them all. Uh, you teach students Greek and Latin roots to help them with the scientific vocabulary. Yeah, great. When there's a list of instructions, I, you can use smart art to, to create that sort of summary. Very good, okay. Again, I'm not gonna be able to read them all. I'll just pick a couple as they're going by. So using Canvas pages with vocabulary so that um, students can kind of like a glossary maybe. I, I wonder if that's what you mean, um, Erica, so they can come back to it. And concrete examples, particularly with their work and activities so they know what to expect, all really good. And. Andrew, hyperlinks, I'm thinking you mean hyperlinks to an explanation or a summary or whatever. So yeah, that would be a great way to do it. You don't necessarily have to come up with the summary. You just wanna make sure it's available for students that might need it. Wonderful. Okay, anybody wanna share a live? Go ahead and um, raise your hand if you do. And you don't have to, I just wanna make sure if someone does, you have up the opportunity. And Wendy's saying, having students sharing resources with each other. Yeah, I mean, crowdsource, why not? Okay, oh, great, Jacqueline, yes. One method that I do to increase collaboration is when I assign students a specific software that they have to find a video and they have to describe a, how it can help them in business, then the students need to respond to other students, but I tell them, please find a software that is new, something that is different so that you can learn something new and then provide feedback. Mm -hmm. So that encourages the collaboration back and forth for them to look 
at other software applications that exist and to read about how it is connected or used in the business world or in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So now they can make a connection of how that software may be able to help them in their workplace or right. in the workplace. And then maybe it'll give them ideas when they're in the workplace. Like, ah, I remember there was a software uh -huh. that could accomplish this. So yeah. that is how I increase that collaboration with the students in that in a Google a slide that all the students have access to the same Google slide, they find their name, they put their video, they describe what usage they would use it for in the business world. So it's all there. Students have access to every single one of them. And then in the comments, then they communicate back and forth to one another. And it's a joy to see the collaboration that yeah. is happening between the two because you see it is bringing awareness to the software applications that are available that can help them in the workplace. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. I see more stuff going on in chat and um, Lorene mentioned about acronyms and you'll notice at the beginning when I said CVC and at one and then I explained what it was so important because again we forget that not everybody knows all of the acronyms that may be related to our particular field and that can be a huge equity thing if you think about it if you just use the acronym and don't explain it the assumption is everyone should already know everyone who's really anyone should already know what that is and so those that don't know what it is kind of get a bad taste in their mouth of uh oh I I must not fit in because I don't know what that acronym is. So just kind of be thinking about that. Wendy, you wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, when you were talking about clarifying vocabulary, um, I work in the writing center at our college as well as teaching English classes. And one thing I notice a lot is that in the assignments students receive from instructors, um, there's often vocabulary that is familiar to the instructor, but not the student. Right. Um, <laughs> So I've really become more aware of that myself in the way I design things, but we all do that. We all get so familiar with what's yep. in our field and we forget that students are beginners. Yep. Um, so. Yeah, um, thank you for underscoring that point. It's, it's <clears throat> yeah, it's so easy to forget and yet it's really can make a big difference. Thanks so much. Okay, last, anybody else wanna raise their hand before we go on? Okay, and actually let me pause before we go into the third category of action or expression. Let me just pause. Cheryl or Stacy, were there any questions in chat that I missed? Or does anybody have a question right now that you want us to spend a minute uh, talking about? Feel no, free to I raise your hand. I didn't see any question marks except okay. about accessible music, uh, sheet music, and that was answered. So you're good. Okay, great. Stephanie, yes, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, I was wondering, so I love the idea of having choice, but when I looked at that example that you put up, I thought about my perfectionist students who would feel obligated to go through every single resource provided. Um, how can, and I, I'm guessing it's how, how we structure the question, right? But how do we um, provide guidance to students who might be overwhelmed by choice right. that right. that's I, that's what i was thinking um and and i'm gonna crowdsource that answer what first comes to my mind is to make it crystal clear that you are not expecting them to read everything you know not just to throw away read a few but it's like you are not expected to read another option is perhaps setting it up so that there's a, a section that says, if you're overwhelmed by choice, read these two things. And then the other part of the page is, if you want choice, here's a bunch of stuff you can choose from so that they can self-determine which is the category they belong to and they will both be able to get the study guide answer. And I'm seeing in chat, limit choices, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, it's always a balance because everybody learns and thinks differently. And so we just need to think, how can I structure this in a way that's going to meet the needs of everyone? 
as explicitly as I can. So you don't want to take away choice just because you know you have those students that are overwhelmed by it, but you also want to recognize the students that are overwhelmed by it and think about how might I set it up in such a way that um, lessens the chance that they will be overwhelmed. You might also, I'm a big believer in asking students. So maybe in one of your student surveys, um, you ask the question, if you're a student that's overwhelmed by choice, what would be a way I could present you with that without overwhelming you and see if they give you any good ideas? Um, <clears throat> Vicki, yes. Hi, I just wanted to share um, um, for vocabulary in my English as a second language class, yeah. um, I created a shared Google slide and students were assigned in groups and every week they had like five or six cultural references in the novel that we were reading. So maybe they had never heard of Rosa Parks or maybe there was like an expression that they didn't know. Right. But the students worked together to do research and they included links to videos or images and the definition. So I um, it was a really good project to make um, the vocabulary more clear. Sounds fun. In the reading and the, the in particular like cultural references. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that. And Mark. Uh, oh. Yeah, the uh, the issue that I the um, question that I have, I guess, is just in, in general is um, are there any other I guess this column following up on one of the other questions that someone had in regards to balancing choice with assessment. Specifically, um, meaning like, you know, if let's say you have one question but you're drawing on, you're choosing three different sources that would, that students can choose. Are, are there situations where you could get to a point where the question is somewhat more, is broader because it needs to fit those three choices so that you are actually, um, you know, there may be like making the goal broader and in what cases could that be a negative thing or if it is a negative thing, how do you deal with that? I what comes to my mind, Mark, is it would really depend on your learning outcome. And is it something that a broader approach is going to get them to the goal? The, the <clears throat> for example, the content itself doesn't matter so much as how they're approaching it or, or what their output is or whatever. But then there may be other contexts where it is a very specific piece of information or a very specific skill. And so you can't really let it go as broad. So you would need to be more focused in the options that you're offering because they have to be sure and address this specific thing that you're talking about. Right. I could see contexts where both might, they wouldn't be relevant at the same time, but you know, one particular activity broader would be fine. Another, it would need to be more narrow. And so your choices may need to be more narrow for that reason. Okay. Is that kind of what you were thinking about? Right, because a lot of our, a lot of our uh, you know, programs are, you know, they're very driven. I mean, the whole curriculum is intertwined with really specific outcomes yeah. and each assignment. I mean, there's really no room for other, you know, for, for um, there's really like almost everything that's done in a curriculum is streamlined to a direct, well, one of the, yeah, uh, one of the shame, outcomes for our yeah. program. So um, if you have many choices, to do a particular thing that is really designed to go straight to a particular outcome, then you could have a scenario where you are trying to have three different, uh, let's say two or three different approaches, but in order to fit those three approaches, your, your, your overall question may need to be broad to fit that. And what, and, and uh, so it sounds like what you're saying is that there are some areas where it may be broad enough to use that approach. And in some cases you just may not be able to. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing, and then um, Alana will get to you. The other thing that comes to mind is you may have a section that is optional and it's clearly marked optional. And by the way, for those of you that follow the OEI rubric, this would be item A10, where you um, say, hey, for those of you that love this topic and want to explore more, here's some resources and here's some idea, you know, questions that might. And so they can just decide, I want to do over and above, but you're the content expert. So you, Mark, are kind of curating for them these things that allow them to go above and beyond in ways that might be really exciting and motivational for them. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Alana. I adapted one of my in-class activities to um, an online activity. I used to have students have vocabulary words that each week I would give them a you know a, a pile of cards and hand them out, and they would have to look up the word and have the definition the next week when they heard the word in discussion in class, they would say, hey, I've got that word, and they would put up, you know, the explanation for it. So I've changed it to be an online thing. And when they they have the words issued to them, I just email them out to the to the um, students and they put it on a, a page. And so by the end of the chapter, they've got all their key vocabulary words in one place just to um, just to make it easier. It gives a little bit more interaction with, with the class as well. So they're kind of creating their own glossary. Yeah, yeah. Great, Great. thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the, the last thing and then we should have some time at the end for more questions and comments. I love all the, the resources and ideas and questions you guys are bringing, so thank you. It's very exciting for me. All right, the third category of universal design for learning is expression. And another way to acknowledge that brains are wired differently and an opportunity to increase your equitable course design is to offer choice in how students demonstrate their mastery. So the theme of choice can run through all three categories. So individuals with significant movement impairments like cerebral palsy, um, students who struggle with strategic and organizational abilities, executive function disorders, those who have language barriers and so forth, are all going to approach learning tasks very differently than the average learner. Some may be able to express themselves really well in written text, but not speech, and vice versa. My, my nephew cannot write to save his life. And the poor boy had to go through an educational system that wants everything written down, et cetera, et cetera. And he didn't do well. If he could have spoken his answers, he would have been an A student. Unless specific media and materials are critical to the goal. So learning to paint specifically with oils or um, handwriting with calligraphy. If the the actual media or materials aren't critical as they are in those particular examples, it's really great to allow a variety of media for expression, such as text, speech, drawing, illustration, comics, storyboards, film, music, dance or movement, visual art, sculpture, or video. So all the different things, we, we sometimes get locked in to one and there's so many other ways that, that things can be demonstrated. So you could also use a variety of evaluation methods as well. Instead of the traditional multiple choice exam, you can encourage students to show their knowledge and skills with essays or projects or portfolios. Instead of having everyone do the same assignment, give them the option to choose between a poster presentation, a research report, or creating a Spark video, as I can't remember, it might have been Jacqueline was mentioning earlier. You can even have your students tell you how they'll demonstrate mastery. You can give them the evaluative criteria, what the outcome and what you're going to be looking for that they have mastered, and then they can come up with the evaluation method in discussion with you. And that could either be done individually or it could be a collaborative activity with small groups or with the whole class. Um, Alana, I'll get to you in one moment. This was a very short one, so I just wanna ask again, actually, no, before we do this, Alana, yes. Um, so I'm wondering if you've had any pushback. That still says I'm muted. Can you hear me? No, or? yeah, we can hear you. Okay, for some reason it still says I'm muted. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any pushback on this. I've been doing this in for two years in my business class, and my chair asked me to share it with um, our whole division. And I got so much pushback because I allow my students in the term assignment to do it in, in many different ways. Because I was one of those students, like, if you tell me you want me to write an essay, 
I would rather have my teeth pulled. Yeah. I hate it. I'm a bullet point person. I can give a presentation. I just, you know, but other Don't make people, me right. Yeah. And other people, if you ask them to give a presentation, they're paralyzed with right. fear. So I give them this opportunity. I've been doing this for two years. When I presented it to the faculty in the business department, they, I got a lot of pushback saying, oh, it just makes it so much harder for me to grade and da-da-da. I found personally that the quality of the assignments that I receive now is, is so much higher than I used to receive. Yeah. And I haven't really had a big struggle at trying to evaluate one against another, but I really got a lot of pushback. I was surprised. Well, and pu pushback from faculty is different yeah. than pushback from students. Exactly. Students tend to like it. And so um, for me, I see it as two, two aspects of the situation. And am I going to put in the foreground oh, this makes it harder for me, I don't want to do it. Or am I going to put in the foreground, this is going to make students more motivated, it's going to give them better, you know, it's kind of what am I really focusing on as my goal? And like you have said, Alana, it's kind of like when I, I try to get people to use rubrics, those that have never used rubrics, oh no, they don't work, I don't like them, they're too, you know, too much. And then when you finally convince them to do it, it's like, oh, now I see why rubrics are really great. And what I hear from instructors that allow for multiple is it's actually more interesting for them. They're not reading 35 of the same essay over and over and over again. It's, it's really exciting for them too. It's more that idea of doing it differently that it's kind of a knee jerk, no, I don't wanna do it. So I, I don't have an answer other than um, helping people understand that it's better for students and in the long run you're probably going to find it's more interesting and exciting for you as well as the instructor it's a nice point though okay um and yeah uh, i'm not sure how to say your name alicia maybe is saying way to go we got to push people to to do things a little differently so in thinking about expression What's one way you might adjust just one of your assignments or assessments to give choice in expression? And think about that for a moment, and then you can either put it in chat or if you want to raise your hand and share, raise your hand. Yeah, Audrey's talking about the whole punctuation grammar thing. Um, and technically, I believe, and you all may correct me if I'm wrong, if punctuation and grammar are not part of the learning outcomes in a particular course, it isn't necessarily appropriate to be so focused on that that it's going to have a huge um, impact on the student's grade. Depends on what you're teaching. Alana, your hand is up. Was that because you didn't put it down or do you have something you want to share? Okay, great. Students do book projects. That sounds fun. Uh, yeah, Chris, it, it, it's, you know, just experiment with it, giving them choice. And Sylvia is saying she's going to try in her discussions have them ask a question that they would like their classmates to address. I just heard that idea in a different webinar that um, some an instructor as part of her discussion prompt says, after you give your opinion, ask a question that's either deepening what you and the, the other students said, or that kind of takes us off in a, a new direction we may not have thought of. So it just builds this really robust discussion because it's not you coming up with one prompt, it's the students having to, to really further the discussion. Anyone else have something you want to share about how you might adjust an assignment or an assessment that allows for choice of expression? Yes, Michael. You're muted. Sorry, I've been in Zoom meetings all morning, so I forget how to use it. Um, 
I adjusted one of my assessments uh, during COVID um, for an incarcerated students program that we have here at Lake Tahoe, but I use it across the board now. Um, instead of taking a test, like a multiple choice test, I have my students make a test. Uh huh. Um, and it's not necessarily about the questions themselves. I ask them to give me a citation of where they got the information for the answers. And I also ask them um, to explain why that, it, why that question or why that concept is, is appropriate. Important. Yeah. Um, but what I found, especially with the incarcerated students program, because all of our students in that program are obviously in some sort of a you know, penitentiary, is that they were developing questions that had examples based on what they were dealing with. So they were very demographic specific. Yeah. So what we did with that, the data that I got from that, you know, the questions was now when we do build, you know, low, low stakes quizzes, we use those questions created by the students in previous terms for our incarcerated students. And we have actually, we haven't taken formal data, um, but the grades on those assessments are going up because that idea of relevance. Right. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. I want, I have one more little topic and then we may have a few more minutes for some open sharing. So accessibility is definitely part of UDL. Learners may have vision, hearing, mobility, or cognitive and or cognitive challenges that impact their ability to interact with your content. Much of what we've already spoken of will help reduce barriers for those with cognitive challenges. To overcome barriers for vision, hearing, or mobility issues, many students use assistive technology, which is just a broad range of devices and software that can help them navigate or maneuver or hear or see or whatever with people with differing abilities um, to get access to the content. To provide the most support for these students, it's really important and critical, in fact, to make sure that your course design supports assistive technology. The main considerations are that you have properly formatted text, both in Canvas and in any external documents, meaning um, you're using the rich content editor in Canvas or in whatever the application tool, Word, PowerPoint, so that you're formatting headings properly, you're formatting true lists, you're adding appropriate alt text for images, you're making sure your link text is descriptive and meaningful. That's going to support screen reader devices for vision impaired learners. You also need to make sure there are accurate captions, and by accurate, we mean it has punctu proper punctuation, capitalization and accurate word matching. So the auto-generated captions from YouTube, yes, they're captions, they're not accurate captions. A deaf person cannot use those to um, really comprehend. There's a whole lot of cognitive overload going on if you try to use YouTube captions. It also means transcripts for audio, for hearing impaired. And then you also wanna think about reading order of a page or a slide elements so that a student use an, and functional keyboard navigation. Both of those apply to students that have mobility impairments who are not able to use a mouse. They have to use a keyboard proper um, in order to navigate through. And if things aren't set up properly, they're not going to be able to consume and comprehend the information. Forgot that one. Yeah, so I talked about that one. So to sum up, UDL, the, the principles, UDL provides multiple means of engagement so that you're giving students choices that's going to fuel their interests and autonomy. What fires up one student isn't going to necessarily fire up another student. You want to provide multiple means of representation. So present content and information and um, ideas or examples in multiple media and in your support resources. You want to also think about providing variety with those support, learning supports. UDL is about providing multiple means of action or expression. So you're giving them plenty of options for how they can demonstrate what they know. 
you're providing models, feedback, and supports for different levels of proficiency. UDL also ensures that content is accessible to students with not only cognitive, but also vision, hearing, and mobility challenges. And we want to layer this with an intentionality about the images, the examples, et cetera, that we're using so that all of our students feel seen and included. This was a rather broad um, overview of the topic of UDL. To learn more, I recommend visiting the CAST website. CAST is the education and research development organization that created the Universal Design for Learning Framework. You don't have to be a member in order to view the website, but if you're interested, membership is free and it allows you access to their really nice book called Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice, which will have a lot more information than I was able to share with you today. I will also add that very recently, the leadership of CAST announced that UDL guidelines are being updated to play a stronger, more explicit role in addressing barriers and injustices that weren't adequately addressed in the original guidelines. To quote a recent blog post, what they said was, urgent among those, the barriers, are the barriers and injustices that affect people primarily based on who they are rather than on what they can do. So on their identity rather than on their ability. Those barriers go by many names, racism, sexism, genderism, ethnocentrism, classism, and ableism. So you can find out more about this redesign and, and how they're intentionally wanting to bring an equity lens to the universal design for learning principles. There was a, a tandem blog series and webinar called Cracks in the Foundation, the Past and Future of UDL Guidelines. And Cheryl or Stacy, if you would put the link um, in chat, the webinar is archived at the web page that they'll be sharing. And what I found really exciting and hopeful about this presentation and blog post was they're really surfacing a distinction between barriers of ability and barriers of identity. David Rose, who's the author of the blog posts and one of the key developers of UDL, points out that UDL has dealt very well with the barriers of ability in a specific learning environment, but barriers of identity may often be more um, culturally and institutionally driven and haven't been as effectively addressed by UDL. So he refers to this as one of the cracks in the UDL guidelines and the impetus for the, the upcoming update. He's not saying that revising UDL to address barriers of identity is going to make the world all better, but he feels it's one very important piece of an intersectional puzzle. And I felt it was definitely worth a read or a listen, so I wanted to offer it to you. Okay, that was really the basics of what I wanted to share with you. We have a very few minutes left. I wanna first off, thank you for being here and let you know that we will be archiving the recording on the, and I should have Stacy and Cheryl given you this, on the at one YouTube webinars playlist. And those of you that are attending, I will be sending out an acknowledgement of your attendance if you need it for flex credit or whatever. So you'll be getting that. And I will try to remember to put a link to the webinar um, playlist in that email so that you can get to it. But let me find out what last minute questions or comments does anyone have to share? and feel free to raise your hand so we can unmute you or if you want to put it in chat. I'm glad you enjoyed it, everyone. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Any last minute comment or question? Um, hi, Helen, this is Nadia yes. here. I, I put a question in the chat around um, transcripts. That was when you were talking about accessibility uh -huh. and how YouTube um, captions are not very accurate. So there's this question came up that if we wanted to support our students, um, could we provide them with a cap with a transcript along with the video? I mean, you know, the best, I guess, thing would be not to use a video that does not have captions, but sometimes um, it happens so that the captions are inaccurate and we want to provide them with a transcript. Now, um, I was just thinking of it from a copyright point of view, better to avoid or like, is it 
um, okay for educational purposes and accessibility. So, purposes. Yeah. So when the captions are inaccurate, is it better to not include the video or what, what other options are there? So in terms of somebody else's YouTube content or whatever, there are caption workarounds where you would be able to, and I, I can't, it, it's a multi-step process, but there are ways around it. My accessibility friends tell me that cop, um, accessibility trumps copyright. Right. And if you are including the video that you have added captions to so that it's actually accurately captioned, within Canvas, so it's behind a password protected environment, it's being used for educational purposes, and you haven't really altered the content, all you've done is add accurate captions, they've said that's not gonna be a copyright issue. However, you'll wanna check with your college to make sure if your college has specific guidelines around dealing with third-party content in that context. Please don't say Helen told me I could, so you can't throw me in jail because mm -hmm. uh, you know I have no no authority. I'm just sharing with you what I know. Yeah. Yeah. The Thank other you so thing much. is to be aware of a transcript is not the equivalent of captions for a video. Because if you think about it, I'm watching the video, I read the transcript. I come back to the video, I read the transcript. I come back to the video, I read. It's a very much a, a, a cognitive overload situation. So with a talking head video where it's really just somebody talking and there's no visuals involved, you're just listening. In that case, a transcript would suffice. But if it were a presentation where there's things going on on the screen, it makes it very difficult for the hearing impaired student to have to constantly split their focus and figure out what's going on. So alternatives are the caption workaround or finding comparable content that is in some other modality, text or speech or whatever, so that um, they're able to get it without having to have that split attention, if, if I said that in a way that makes sense. And I know we're over time, so if anybody needs to go, please, feel free thank you for being here but i wanted to address your question nadia yeah no thank you so much that makes a lot of uh, sense yeah great thank you okay i want to thank you again for being here and we will post the video probably later today captions usually take three to five business days so they probably won't be ready for a week or so it's been a pleasure thank you so much for caring about your students and wanting to bring some new ideas and ways of doing things to your teaching so that they have a better learning experience. I really acknowledge you for that. Thanks, everybody. See you later.